Well, welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future and future creators. And for all those that like really great stories, uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your uh, health and longevity ambassador along for this journey. So on the past few shows, we've been taking a, uh, a virtual around the world jaunt. Mm -hmm. uh, from Places like Palau in the in the remote South Pacific uh, to Mauritius in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And we've been talking with various thought leaders and visionaries about the themes of innovation, entrepreneurship, technology, economic development. Uh, but you know, one thing that we really haven't uh, begun to explore in much detail yet is the topic of the blue economy. Um, according to the World Bank definition, uh, the blue economy is defined as the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improving livelihood and jobs while preserving the health of the ocean ecosystem. Uh, in addition to many of the traditional ocean activities that we normally think about, like fishing, tourism, shipping, the blue economy entails a wide range of emerging industries, uh, such as renewable energy, aquaculture, uh, extractive activities from the seabed, marine biotechnology, and bioprospecting. Uh, the blue economy also uh, embraces different aspects of the ecosystem that are not normally captured by the market, but provide contribution to economic and human activities. Uh, things like carbon sequestration, uh, coastal protection, waste disposal, uh, biodiversity protection. Uh, current uh, World Wildlife Foundation brief puts the value of ocean assets around the world about $24 trillion, with an estimate employment of about 3 million people worldwide today. Uh, today, I'm glad to say I'm joined by Ms. Lysandra Rickards, who is the Chief Entrepreneurship Officer at the Branson Center of Entrepreneurship in the Caribbean, uh, headquartered in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, the Branson Center is a nonprofit organization which was formed through the philanthropic organization uh, known as Virgin Unite. Uh, which is a nonprofit foundation of the Virgin Group, uh, the British multinational uh, conglomerate founded by Sir Richard Branson. Uh, as the CEO, she spearheads the center's strategy to support growth stage entrepreneurs towards investment and raises funding for expansion of the center's mission. Uh, she previously headed the program department where she was developing equity loan, crowdfunding, and other grant opportunities, designing and developing the core content of the center, uh, its online platform, uh, and its uh, Alpha Angels Network of Business Angels of Jamaica, as well as doing a wide range of impact analysis and reporting. Uh, before she was involved in the Branson Center, uh, Lissandra conducted economic and statistical research for the best selling books Free Economics and Super Free Economics. Uh, she consulted for the Ministry of Finance in Jamaica. She worked worked up here in New York City at Bain & Company, uh, as well as helping to develop the global brand strategy for the Caribbean conglomerate Grace Kennedy. Uh, she was also previously a director of business development in the RMP Group, which is a private investment group based in Orlando, Florida, that targeted business in the United States, uh, servicing the Fortune 1000 clients. Uh, Lissandra is an MBA, first year honors from Harvard Business School, being economics from uh, University of Chicago, where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa and student Marshall. And in 2008, she was featured in CNBC documentary, The Money Chase Inside Harvard Business Business School. Uh, Lissandra, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show today and talk about what you're doing. Thanks, Ira. Thanks for having me. No, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Um, you know, typically, we start off the show just by giving our guests the floor for a little bit just to talk about themselves, uh, to you know, introduce you, you know, your background, uh, how you're interested in, in all things entrepreneurship and business, and sort of your path from Jamaica to, to the United States and back around, and how you are now sort of uh, Lissandra Rickard's path towards where you are today. That would be great. Sure. I mean, you gave such an amazing introduction already. I think you've told my whole story. <laughs> but yes, um, growing up in Jamaica, I actually wanted to be the Minister of Finance here because I saw how with some tweaks to our economic policy, we could really be on a much stronger growth trajectory. I saw all my friends around me migrating to more developed countries for a better life. And I wanted us all to grow up together and to raise families together and to still be here as in part and create a community here. And so I actually went to the University of Chicago to study economics because it was well known as the forefront of thought in economics. Mm -hmm. um, lots of or the Nobel laureates came out of the University of Chicago. And while there, I took a course called the Economics of Crime with Steve Levitt, who is the author of Freakonomics. 
And I worked with him, as you said, doing a statistical analysis on his new book, Freak Super Freakonomics. And he was he became my mentor. And I told him I wanted to get a PhD in economics and I wanted to be the minister of finance for Jamaica. And he said that, you know, he didn't think I should be an academic. He mm. thought I had way too much personality and passion and spirit to be behind a computer for five years running regressions. And he was the one who encouraged me to apply to business school instead. So, um, okay, so I ended up applying to one business school, which was Harvard Business School. And that was really because I wanted to move back to Europe. I had lived in Spain in my junior year in college. Mm. And I thought, you know, I want to live in Spain again and do business school in Spain. But if I get into Harvard, then mm -hmm. I'll go to Harvard, right? And so said, so done, I got into HBS, which was an incredible growth experience for me. The network is incredible. The travel, the people, I just, it was the best two years of my life, really. And, uh, but I went to HBS during the recession in the US. And so there was a hiring freeze at a lot of companies. I think uh, most companies had a hiring freeze at the time. And I also at this time was grappling with burnout. You know, mm -hmm. it's really hard. You know, University of Chicago has a very rigorous program. Um, Freakonomics was very rigorous in terms of thought. Uh, business school was very mentally taxing as well. And so I decided I wanted to come back to Jamaica to refine myself again mm -hmm. and to you know work and figure out okay I've done all this achievement and all these tick the box and all of these educational institutions and now who am I and what do I like doing and I took three jobs in three years I just bounced around if I didn't like it I quit and move on to something else <laughs> and found what I loved at the Branson Center which is a mission driven enterprise where I had the chance to see the impact on of my work on people's lives and livelihoods, which I just I just loved it. And initially, I was just going to be a consultant for six months, and I ended up staying there. This will be my seventh year, mm. and I became CEO three years into it. Uh, so that's my story. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And I would say it, it, I, I I can think of worse places to end up once you're. <laughs> <laughs> Once you burn out, then back in Jamaica. So I, I can definitely appreciate that uh, that journey. Um, speaking of that, though, um, you know, before we get into sort of some of the the different things the the center is up to, um, you know, so Caricom represents these, you know, fifteen countries. Uh, Jamaica obviously sits at the top as you know a much larger economy much more diversified uh in terms of agriculture or mining forestry manufacturing things of this nature um for for those of us you know like myself that are only familiar with the Caribbean primarily from a tourist angle could you just go into a little bit of sort of some of the the core issues that the Caribbean is facing in 2019 from the perspective of uh, challenges, uh, issues, and, and and sort of those problems, and then ultimately, you know, why the Branson, how the Branson Institute is set up in sense to address them. Sure. So uh, the biggest challenge, in my view, and I can only give you my perspective, is that we are a grouping of small island states, mm -hmm. which are separated by the sea, of course and which have small populations where if, if you're building a business and you want to see scale and growth, you want a large population to support right. the scalability of that business. And so the inherently small populations kind of has in the past limited the growth of industry and business, which is why, yes, you have that perception that and it's the truth that most Caribbean territories are very reliant on tourism, with the exception of a few. Uh, Jamaica is very interesting in that we have the largest English speaking population in the Caribbean and we have a very quite educated labor force. So we have seen a growth in the business process outsourcing industry call centers and other type of outsourcing near shoring of these activities are coming to Jamaica and it has created a lot of employment over the last 10 years, a lot of growth, 
we see a lot of investment in that area. Usain Bolt himself has launched his own BPO center in Kingston. Um, and so that has really been a driver of increased employment. Also, what happened in Jamaica was that we have had an IMF agreement since the global recession of 2009. We just mm -hmm. ended it this year, 10 years. And we actually, for the first time in our history, adhered to the, um, uh, what do you call it? Austerity, right? So we adhered mm -hmm. to the austerity policy and we brought down our debt to GDP ratio from 150% debt to GDP to this year, it was at 97%, mm. which is a miracle story. Mm. The IMF is raising us up as this success story for austerity around the world. But what this has done has freed up resources that were once dedicated to repaying debt and interest payments. I think 67% of our budget in the past went to loan payments, mm -hmm. which is crazy, right? right? So there was very little investment for the past 10, 15 years in schools and healthcare and roads, et cetera. And for the first time in the last two or three years, we now have the fiscal space to invest in infrastructure to enable our citizens to grow and experience a better quality of life and enable our businesses to grow as well and to reach out and to export more. And so Barbados just started their own agreement with the IMF and we're seeing economies in the Caribbean trying to diversify away from tourism and they really see entrepreneurship as the way to go to diversify. And that's where the Branson Center comes in. Our mission is to create dynamic Caribbean economies through entrepreneurship. And we believe that when we see more dynamism, more transactions, more M&A activity, more IPOs, more investment, more customers and clients, then we'll see some real growth and decrease the unemployment rates and increase the growth trajectory of the Caribbean islands. And Jamaica has been a success story for us there where the IPO market in Jamaica is very hot for the first mm -hmm. time in my living memory. In fact, Bloomberg named the Jamaica Stock Exchange the best performing stock exchange in the world for the past three years in terms of growth. And that's because of this structural transition where capital is now moving out of government bonds and government papers and moving into investing in business because or interest rates have come down because of this IMF agreement. So that's a summary. It's a lot more technical than that, um, but we're seeing now a lot of potential and really the beginning of a boom, hopefully, in the Caribbean economy and particularly in the Jamaican economy. Outstanding, outstanding. I, I appreciate that overview and it, it, it clearly from uh, when, you, when you look at the history of it and now from, you know, I, I've been reading a lot myself up here about sort of the say the miracle story, but the amazing growth that's going on there. And now you're at this amazing inflection point where now you can take additional resources and invest in, uh, in more in the future. And that's uh, probably a wonderful feeling uh, to have and a wonderful place Fantastic. to be. But the biggest um, challenge, sorry, Ira, the no, biggest go ahead, go ahead. challenge that we face is climate change. Sure. We are at the forefront of the climate war. So everything that's happening elsewhere in the world in terms of emissions, etc., we bear the effects of it in the Caribbean first. And you're seeing that, the whole world is seeing that with the dramatic increase in the number of Category 5 storms, hurricanes. Yeah that are coming through the region, but we're also seeing it in the erosion of our beaches. There's been an overgrowth of sargassum seaweed that is threatening our tourism ecosystem. It's also threatening Miami and Florida coastline. And so climate change is really the biggest threat globally, but also particularly for the Caribbean. Absolutely, absolutely. And that, that's a thank you for that, because it's a great segue into my next uh, question, uh, which, you know, happens to do with this, this theme of the blue economy. And it's funny because I, I was in Barbados <laughs> just a little while ago and talking about Sargassum. There were beaches that, you know, the sand was totally obscured by this uh, this orange algae that, you know, obviously is natural, but uh, there's been extreme overgrowth of it. It's been ending up, you know, not just in, obviously in Jamaica, but Barbados, St. Lucia, everywhere. And, and it's funny because in, in a past career, uh, when I was in the agricultural agricultural biotech space, 
um, I, I ran into one of your entrepreneurs, uh, Johanna Dujan, who is uh, in, in part of your um, your class or your cohort of uh, uh, sort of blue economy investments, where he's taking this uh, waste product, let's say, or this this very low value uh, natural product that the ocean is spinning up uh, because of man uh, and other factors, uh, taking a very low value raw material and creating very high value products with it in terms of agricultural uh, you know, growth uh, stimulating products and potentially health products, maybe even pharmaceuticals he talks about. Um, and then you know, aside from sort of those value added products, uh, you're also investing in, um, in companies involved in bioplastics. Obviously we don't want any more plastics in the ocean than we need. You're investing in uh, companies that are getting the conservation message out. Can you just talk a little bit more about sort of this sort of this integrated blue economy vision? Because I, I think it's completely fascinating in all the things that you're, you're getting your feet into. Right, so the blue economy is really important to the Caribbean, as you so rightly pointed out. We have fishermen that depend on it for their livelihood. We have, um, we have the tourism industry that heavily depends on what's happening in the oceans and so on. And, and so we actually received a generous grant from the Getch Foundation to create a blue economy program, which we piloted this year with our first cohort of blue economy entrepreneurs. Um, and what we've seen is that it's very different. It's a very different industry from the other industries that we usually work with mm -hmm. because there's not a lot of entrepreneurship happening yet there. The majority of the activity in the blue economy is from NGOs, from the mm -hmm. government, multilateral institutions, scientists. But in terms of creating businesses that positively impact ocean health, we're just starting to see people now emerging in that area particularly in the Caribbean, there's more interest now. And so it's more of a startup space uh, in terms of the entrepreneurial ecosystem than it is a scale up space. So the Brands Center or core programming and accelerator cohort focuses on scale up growth stage entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and them grow and get investment, et cetera. And so with the blue economy, we are having to shift gears back to our roots of more early stage entities and helping them. But what we are seeing is a lot of innovation. Uh, everybody cares about what's happening here. Um, and everybody cares about warming of the oceans and all the negative impact that that has had on our coral reefs, on our fish populations, overfishing, all of that. And so we have right now in our cohort, a diving company started as a diving company and now is a, a conservation entity, conserving ocean health and educating people about ocean health through dive tours. We have, as you said, a bioplastics company, very exciting, um, a scientist who invented a plastic from, um, from fruit waste, so cassava waste, mm -hmm. he used to create a plastic that dissolves in water after a certain amount of time. And so that's very exciting if you have a plastic that now dissolves when it's in the ocean. Sure. And he's been getting a lot of interest because of how innovative he has been. And then we have a, a restaurant, a seafood restaurant, who works a lot with the, the fishermen, the whole supply chain of fish. Um, she does a lot to help uh, su sustainable livelihoods with the fishermen that supply her seafood restaurant and education around sourcing, etc., as well. Mm -hmm. So very interesting takes, very different takes on how you can create an entrepreneurial organization within the blue economy. And we're very excited about expanding this program for the next cohort, which starts in January. We're actually recruiting right now for more blue economy entrepreneurs that are either based in the Caribbean or that have a major impact and major operations in the Caribbean. Excellent, excellent. Um, moving, moving from the blue then onto land, it's sort of what I'll term the green economy. Uh, you also have a, a lot of sort of what we call terrestrial uh, projects in terms of, uh, well, obviously, you know, I said earlier, you know, obviously Jamaica is known in the past for you know, sugar and coffee and, and fruits and, and so forth. Um, 
can, can you talk a little bit about sort of the higher out value added components to agriculture, um, some of the things you're doing there? And then the, the other, one of the uh, sort of a side question, I, I, once again, I'm sorry to go back to my other careers, but <laughs> here, about 20 years ago, I had the honor uh, of, um, of meeting um, Manly West, Dr. Manly West, who was a famous Jamaican pharmacologist that did a lot of work with um, with cannabis and pharmaceutical research. Um, and and interestingly enough, this is one theme as I've been traveling around the world and with all the sort of the, the rules changing and the and legalization and decriminalization even here in the United States, um, you know, cannabis has been such a theme. And I was just, as a second part of that, I just didn't know if, if there was initiatives on this front in Jamaica at all as a as a as additional value added because I remember Dr. West's research from from years ago. He was literally thirty years ahead of of anything that was going on up here in cannabinoid research. But um, talking generally about the green economy, if you would. Right. Wow. Okay. Well, I will start by saying that the entrepreneurs that we work with now are high value added entrepreneurs and a lot of them are in the services and technology industry okay. which you know when people think about jamaica or the caribbean they don't necessarily think about that type of entrepreneur first as you rightly pointed out they think about agricultural cannabis etc which i'll touch on but who we have in our cohort right now we have publishers tech guys we have animators, animation companies. We have a chocolate, a chocolate company that's <laughs> looking to export. And what we did last year was we instituted a minimum revenue threshold. We wanted entrepreneurs with traction that we could really <laughs> accelerate to impact the economy. So on average, our entrepreneurs have five hundred thousand dollars per year in revenue, U.S. Mm -hmm. dollars, on average, and that's who we're attracting at that revenue threshold. Got it. So but in the past, when we were looking at startups, and that's companies between zero and 100,000 US in revenues per year, we had a lot more consumer-based agricultural companies. For mm -hmm. example, we had coffee growers, coffee distributors, cacao, chocolate makers. We had quite a few of those. Um, we had recently a greenhouse manufacturer who also grows strawberries and has a issue manufactures greenhouses for other farms grows mm -hmm. themselves strawberries etc and also was developing an eco tour and eco lodge on some land that they had so in terms of the green space we have seen quite a few interesting companies come through our doors over the past seven or eight years that we've been in existence cannabis is very interesting because even though Jamaica is a, a you know globally recognized brand in that space, mm -hmm. we actually recently decriminalized cannabis, and there is a licensing authority that now issues licenses for large scale growing for certain uses, particularly mm -hmm. medicinal uses, right now. Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of overseas interests because of our brand in the space. We've had a lot of foreign investors now coming in and local in, um, entrepreneurs trying to get a license from the licensing authority to either grow or package or distribute or a combination of all three. So one of our entrepreneurs right now who is an app developer has a side business with his partner that is in this space. Um, they have a retail store that sells paraphernalia related to cannabis mm -hmm. and they're for a distribution license so that they can do what happens in Amsterdam when you go to the store and you can buy, you know, taste testing of different strains mm -hmm. and, um, and trying, um, you know, different right in the store, being able to purchase and use the paraphernalia, the, the smoking paraphernalia that they normally sell in the store. Um, and I know about that entrepreneur from that size, which is smaller, all the way up to massive growing organizations who have bought up acres and acres of land and are repurposing it for farming and overseas exports with of course the brand Jamaica attached to mm -hmm. it and you of course know about the Marleys um, Damien Marley buying a prison in California and converting mm. it to a greenhouse for marijuana which they'll put the Marley brand on mm -hmm. so uh, that is one of the areas that is very exciting in Jamaica right now. BPO, cannabis, there is a lot of investment going into these new areas. And over the next 10 years, I'm really excited to see 
how this can transform our economy. Excellent, excellent. Uh, one other question about um, healthcare, um, and I've, I've seen um, once again the, sort of the theme of uh, medical tourism, uh, wellness travel, uh, things of this nature. We're in sort of a, a step beyond traditional tourism that is really taking off in, in, in a lot of different areas now. And I recently read something uh, both about the uh, government of Jamaica and the Jamaica um, the promotion Jamaican Jamaica Promotions Company, where this mm-hmm. was something that they were trying to get going. I, I'm not sure if you're We've gotten active in sort of this area of healthcare services as much yet, but is this something that uh, you would be looking at as well? Well, in my previous life as an investor working for an investment firm, this was something that we looked at heavily uh, because the Caribbean has a natural competitive advantage here in terms of weather um, and near how close we are to the U.S., how easy it is to get a flight here. It's Mm a 90 minute flight from Miami to Kingston or to Montego Bay and or healthcare is much cheaper um, and, you know, relaxing great weather. Uh, So I do know that this is something that has, for the past 10 years, been on the agenda of the government. And we've seen um, medical tourism, like hospitals that cater to this segment pop up, particularly in Montego Bay in the West, not as much in Kingston. I think Barbados has really been the leader in this area. And I know they have a fertility clinic there that's mm-hmm. doing quite well in the medical tourism space. Um, but I think there's a lot of room to grow. It's just an area that requires heavy capex, heavy upfront investment. Sure. And that capex is currently going to BPOs and cannabis more so than the medical tourism sector. But I'm sure um, it's a space that can grow a lot in the region. Yeah. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, amongst the rest of the the current cohort, or maybe I, I say I don't nothing confidential, but um, I, I guess this is kind of a- like asking which one of your children you like the most. But um, are, there, are there other investments, other members of the cohort, sort of that you are, you specifically are ultra excited about that you want to talk about? The things that uh, obviously you're, you're involved in many things, but any specific opportunities that you want to talk about that uh, are <laughs> super exciting to you personally. I think what's really exciting is when we see people that have gone through our program then prepare themselves to pitch in front of our deal room, which is um, we brought together some of the larger sources of institutional capital to the table to look at deals that are coming out of the Branson Center because we really believe that we need to create a proper functioning venture capital industry here. Um, We don't, we have angel groups now, as you mentioned in the intro, we have First Angels based in Kingston and we had Alpha Angels based in Montego Bay. And then we have larger private equity investments that happen. But in the middle venture, we don't have much activity at all. Mm. The big guys, the big sources of capital, like the banks, et cetera, they say that they're so busy with their big deals because our stock market is so hot right now that they don't have the same bandwidth to look at venture, which is smaller size, smaller ticket size, and possibly not gonna move the needle as much as their bigger deals. And then at the lower end of the table with the angel groups, the venture side ticket size is too large for the angel groups to look at. So there is this missing middle and we have been trying to create the market for that along with the Development Bank of Jamaica and a lot of other players. The Development Bank of Jamaica has a venture capital um, initiative that's been happening for the past six or seven years. They've been very actively trying to attract venture capitalists to the island, but the big Um, challenge that we've heard from the venture capitalists overseas was that there's not enough deal flow at the venture stage, Mm. which can take a million to two million to four million dollar ticket size um, Mm. and accept that in funding and use it in their business. So we took a very strategic decision in 2018 to really position ourselves in that space, target entrepreneurs who can take in that size of funding and do a lot of work with it. And that is what is really exciting for me, but also quite frustrating because when you're coming from a history of risk aversion coming out of our financial crisis in the late 1990s, the banks, the pension funds, the sources of capital, they're used to putting their money with the government and getting paid back. They're not used to putting it at risk. So they 
risk with big entities, but the shift to venture, it's just such a chasm for us to cross. And we've been pulling and tugging on the capital side, and we've been preparing and preparing entrepreneurs to be able to utilize this funding. And there's still some friction in the market. We're still not seeing enough investment at that size. Because now we're very confident that the entrepreneurs we're getting, they're prepared, they're ready for the funding. It's just now we need to get the sources of capital to really pay more attention and have more focus on this space and carve out some time and resources to invest at this size. So that's what excites me a lot. Um, we are having another pitch event in a couple of weeks at the end of this month. And we had one last year where five million US dollars worth of deals were pitched mm -hmm. from something like from businesses as diverse as a restaurant that's making over a million US a year in turnover to a high tech company that's doing stuff in reg tech. Um, creating algorithms to help companies keep abreast of regulations, changes, mm -hmm. GDPR, etc. cetera. Um, we just showcased a range of entities. All of them got interest from the investors in the room. But again, the due diligence phase took a long time. It's still going on nine months later mm -hmm. and in the term sheets, etc. So that's the area that we're really trying to reduce the fric friction on that side. Makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's uh, yeah, but that's, that's something I'm really excited about because we are literally creating an industry from yeah. scratch, and we have been trying for the past two or three years, and it will take another four or five years for us to really see momentum in this space. But we're in it, um, and we're really trying to push the needle on that. I think that will be a game changer for the region. It will be. It will be, and it's great you're right in the middle of it. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, coming back to you though, just, you know, really one, one final wrap up question. This has to do more with um, uh, sort of influencers in your uh, career to date. Obviously you mentioned the, the connection to your time in Chicago and Freakonomics and so forth. Uh, any other uh, important influencers uh, in your life throughout your career so far that have, you know, kept you on this path, kept you, uh, you know, obviously, it's tough business, you know, things, deals go right sometimes, they don't always go, but people that, uh, you know, anyone you want to give a shout out to that have kept you on the straight path and, uh, you know, encouraged you to, mm -hmm. to stay with this? Yeah, I have many, of course. Everybody has to, you know, you can't do everything on your own, especially when you doubt yourself sometimes. You need people that you can either reach out to or that you admire who inspire you to, to keep going and honor your intuition and follow what you think and know is right. Um, so locally in Jamaica, one of my biggest mentors has been Richard Biles, who is currently the governor of the Bank of Jamaica, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he wasn't. <laughs> He's been my friend for a very long time, and he became the governor of the Bank of Jamaica this year, um, and he's been a pretty big influence. Also, um, another uh, person in the finance world, managing director of capital options, Oliver Holmes. He was my mentor for many years. I worked out of his office mm -hmm. in Kingston while I was remote. I was remote working for the Branson Center for three or four of my seven years there until I became CEO. I was remote working from Kingston and the center was in Montego Bay. He gave me office space for free and mm -hmm. was a great mentor for me. Um, but overseas, of course, you know, Marie Forleo is someone I just love. <laughs> She's a life coach. She has a media empire. And my next act will be to create my own company. And I just love that coaching and online course business model. Um, so actually, a big announcement I can make on your podcast is that I will be stepping down as CEO at the end yeah. of year of the Branson Center. Uh, we have a new incoming CEO who is going to be fantastic and we're going to put it in the press in next week in Jamaica. So you're the first person that ah, got the news. I got the scoop. All right. <laughs> I like that. Um, and so the, my next act will be to launch my own company in that online coaching and course space. I ha already have launched it. Um, just a small on online community called Soul Career. And then finally, I would have to, of course, say Richard Branson, the entrepreneur, the global 
beacon for entrepreneurs around the world. It has been nothing short of incredible working in a company that he has created. He has redefined what it means, what company culture means. That's been what's been really impactful on my own life. Because the three years after business school where I started working here, I left, I started working there, I left, I landed at Virgin and the Brands Center and I stayed. Why? Because it's fun, it's dynamic, it's always innovative, always changing. There's a focus on people and loving the people that you work with and the team that you work with. And that is what I was hungry for when I was searching. And then there's this focus on a mission. And then at the head of this, you have this incredibly dynamic entrepreneur who has so much energy, so much stamina. I'll just tell you a quick story before we wrap up Please. that. We were relaunching the Branson Center in Kingston and Richard Branson was coming to help us relaunch it when we moved from Montego Bay to Kingston. At 3 a.m. that morning, he was in Chicago meeting with President Obama. He landed in Kingston at 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. I went to brief him at 7.30 a.m. We went to the Branson Center to open it at 8 a.m. At, from 8 to 11 a.m. At 11, we went to a meeting with potential donors to the Brands Center. From 1, and so we had a luncheon with them from 11 to 1. From 1 to 3, he went downstairs. It was at a hotel, so upstairs was the luncheon. Downstairs was a conference put on by the young leaders of the Americas Initiative. And he went and he gave a keynote speech at that conference from 1 to 3 p.m. And then he was back on his plane going back to Necker Island for a dinner with some guests on the island there. That was just one day in the life of this incredible man who has incredible energy and has done so much in the world and is still doing so much in the world. So that has been incredibly inspiring for me as well. Absolutely, and I, I, I can hear it, you know, as I listen to you and I hear the passion in your voice for these things, <laughs> it clearly, you know, has rubbed off on you <laughs> and uh, you seem to have the same energy and obviously I never met Richard Banson, but it, it seems that you have definitely channeled uh, and learned from that model. And it seems that, you know, what, you, what you've done and now what you're moving on to, congratulations, you're going to be ultra successful at and, and, and continue yeah. this, uh, this path. But, um, I, you know, I get tired. He doesn't get tired. Sometimes uh, I get tired. <laughs> I get tired too. It's, it's, <laughs> Well, Lissandra, it's it's really um, it's been an honor meeting you and, and having you on the show and just to you know hearing you talk about uh, your your career, your vision, your path uh, is very inspiring. Um, we you know we have this thing on the show about you know it's all about moving the human story forward, and you seem to really be uh, emulating that in terms of just everything that you you are doing, not just. You know, in your own career, but everything you're doing uh, for Jamaica, for the region, uh, is completely fascinating. And just really want to thank you uh, for that. Um, and, and once again, for everybody either going to be watching the show or those that are going to be listening on the radio networks, uh, we've been we've been joined today by the amazing Lissandra Rickards, uh, full of energy, vitality, passion, uh, Chief Entrepreneurship Officer of the Branson Center for Entrepreneurship, but moving on to uh, what's in the new company, Salt. Soul Career. Soul Career and all success there as well. But uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to to join us and share your amazing knowledge with us. It's been really great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.